Pastor, I didn't wait till he went out of town to do this. So just so everybody knows. Good morning, church family. I just wanted to share a little bit about Citrus Pregnancy Center and what we're doing. Um, I don't want to take up a lot of time this morning. Um, God's already on the move, and we don't want to take away from what he's, what he's doing. Um, I do want to let you know that I have a table out there that will, um, I'll be out there afterwards. So if I don't touch anything that you have questions about, um, feel free to stop by and I'll answer any of your questions. Um, Citrus Pregnancy Center, how many of you remember several years back we did a bottle drive? Um, they were raising money for ultrasound machine and we filled the baby bottles. It is the same, uh, the same ministry. It was called Life Choice back then, but um, we have the DBA of Citrus Pregnancy Center, but they are in fact one and the same. Um, I just want to share a little bit about what we do there. We are a medical pregnancy resource center. That means that we do the medical part as well. We don't um, treat for medical, but we do ultrasounds early trimester. Um, we mostly do that to prove the viability of pregnancies and also so that young ladies, and not just young ladies, we have clients of all ages can actually see their baby for the first time. Once they see that baby, the chances of them choosing abortion go down dramatically. So it's very important that we're we're able to do that. So in addition to free pregnancy tests, free ultrasounds, we are a nonprofit. We offer all of the things we do at no cost to the client, which is an amazing thing to be able to do. Um, but we, we are need, in need of help. You know, we, need, we are ran by volunteers. Our nurses, um, everybody that does the ultrasounds, right, right down to our medical director, are all volunteers that give of their time and their resources to be there and to help. So um, along with myself and two other employees, we are the only paid people there. And I can say we're not in it for the money. Let me just say that. Um, and we do what we do because we want to save babies. But more importantly than that, guys, it's about the moms and it's about the dads. And whether a woman chooses life or not, and that is always our desire. And I'd love to stand up here and tell you that every woman that walks through the doors chooses life, but that would not be so. Um, some of the most heartbreaking things that I have to do is follow-up calls. And to hear that um, some of the pregnancies have been terminated is, it's hard. I wasn't prepared for what I was gonna experience emotionally when I took that job seven months ago. How many of you paid attention to the words in that last song that we sang, that he is a chain breaker? And I am here to tell you today that if you've ever struggled with that, and statistically, many of you in this room have been affected, not only by unplanned pregnancies, but by abortion. Um, if that's you sitting in the room today, he can take care of that. That is not the unforgivable sin, although it, it does accompany with great heartache and something that women have to carry around. So whether you were one of those women that had an abortion one year ago or 25 years ago, that is still an area of your life that God wants to touch. And that is another thing that we do at the Pregnancy Center. We do post-abortion counseling. Um, we do... Um, we do a, a Bible study, a very intensive study that leads you through that. And the director herself is post-abortive, so she has a special heart to lead women through that. So if that's you, um, just know that that resource is available as well. Another thing I wanted to mention rather quickly is that we embrace men at the Pregnancy Center. How many of you know it takes more than one for a woman to get pregnant? And we want to be there for the men as well. Um, we also have post-abortive counseling for men. When I started working there, I thought that was amazing. They embrace the family as a whole, the family unit. We try, um, we have classes for parenting. We have classes, we have marriage classes at the Pregnancy Resource Center. Who would have known? Relational classes. Um, so many things that are available to help. So my reason for coming to you this morning is twofold. One, to let you know that we're here in Citrus County. If you or your family or anybody you know needs us, we're available. Um, the other reason is because we need help. We need volunteers such as yourselves. We have so many different ways that you can volunteer, straight from being in the rooms with the young ladies, which that does require a lot of training, but um, also just, you know, Sometimes people want to cook for some for an event or something. We just we have so many things that we need volunteers for. Um, maybe you're a retired nurse and you would like to be trained to do ultrasounds. I mean, there's limitless opportunities. I don't have enough time to share with you all of the opportunities we have, but 
Um, we have an informational meeting coming up at the end of this month. It's on a Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock. I'm not sure if we're going to have it at our Crystal River location or our Inverness location, but if you're interested, sign up. I will get with you and get you some information. We would love to have you volunteer. And not only volunteer, but, um, you know, prayer. Prayer is so important in what we do. We are in the front lines, and until I started there, I had no idea the magnitude of the problem right here in our own backyard. So just be in prayer for our organization, for our ministry. And also, um, we do have a gala coming up um, the 6th of November. Pardon me, the 3rd. It is on a Thursday evening. Um, you're welcome to attend. It is a fundraising event. It's our biggest event of the year. Semi-formal. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, there's going to be a Senator John... Grant is his name. I always remember because of Janet's husband, John Grant. But he is a former senator that wrote the book, The Issue of Life, and he is going to be speaking that evening. So just be in prayer um, and prayerfully consider what God would have you do for this ministry here in our own backyard. Thank you so much. Amen. She's so beautiful. She's kind of short, though. <laughs> if she didn't have her heels on, you wouldn't have seen her over the pulpit on this side. You'd have totally just not seen her. Amen? No, she's awesome. <laughs> Praise God. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. That's where we're going to start off in the message today. Uh, the, today's message is titled, Maintaining and Sustaining Your Victory. How many of you know that over the past several months, we've had a lot of, of preaching and teaching going on on victory and, and, and defeating the giants in your life and, and defeating uh, spirits of rejection and spirits of depression and the things that attack you and come against you? But how many of you know you can defeat that and you can win the battle, uh, but you can also end up right back in the same situation if you're not careful? So there are some things that only God can do because only God can deliver you from a situation. Only God can set you free. Only God can deliver you from demonic oppression. Only God can deliver you from addiction. But you can choose to walk right back into it if you're not careful. You can choose to move right back in the same direction that got you chained up and bound up before if you're not careful. So, so you have some responsibilities in the matter. Amen. So God does do part of it. So what's the saying goes that if God does the supernatural, you do the natural, right? So we have a responsibility in it to maintain and sustain our victory. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse 14 is where we're going to start this morning. I'm going to give you guys a lot of information in a short amount of time. So, so some of this, if, if this hits home for you and you just seem like you need a little more, you know, feel free to, to grab, go on the podcast go on YouTube and check it out after the fact and uh, get everything that you need out of this. Um, if you need specific notes, I am more than happy to give you specific notes. Just email me. Go on the church website at www.crystalrivercog.com and if you would like a copy of today's notes, I will email those to you. Why? Because I have a, a major calling um, in my life that God has directed me to see people set free to see people walking in victory, to see people uh, no longer affected by things that have affected them their entire lives and how to walk in victory in that. I have a specific desire to see that. So I will send you notes if you need them. If you're at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, say amen. If not, say you're moving too quick. No, I didn't hear any of that. So, so let's start reading in chapter, in chapter 2, verse 14 is where we're going to start. Now, thanks be to God who always, say always, always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Now, have you ever read a scripture and went, man, I'm not sure if that's true. Have you ever read a scripture and then took that scripture and placed it against your experiences and said, man, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure about that. I'm not calling God a liar. I'm just saying I don't completely understand what he means by that scripture because it comes out in the scripture. Now, thanks be to God who always, always leads us in triumph in Christ. And I don't know about you, but have you ever felt defeated? 
Have you ever been in a situation where you prayed and prayed and prayed, but you still didn't see breakthrough? You still didn't see your healing. You may be sick and you're waiting on God to heal you and you believe that God's going to heal you. And for whatever reason, in God's infinite knowledge, he chooses not to. Or maybe it was a family member that you believed and believed and believed for their healing and you believed God was going to touch their body and rise them up. But for some reason, whatever reason, in God's infinite knowledge, he decided not to and you felt lost and then you come across a scripture like this in your morning reading that says now God always leads us in triumph in Christ and we go well God what about this time well God what about this time and, we, and I believe that Paul, as he's writing this scripture, is saying that all things will eventually work for the good of those in Christ. So it may not be the, the response, it may not be the situational ending that we choose, but it's what God chooses, and in all things God does eventually works for the good of those in Christ. I've heard it been put this way by one pastor. He said, we can be set up positionally for success and triumph and set up conditionally for failure. We can be set up positionally by accepting Christ and receiving him into our life for success and triumph and victory, but we still have conditions around us and in our life that still affect us and can cause us to fail. So it's not just about positional. Positional is where you're at this morning. You got up this morning and you got in your car and you drove or you might have got on a bicycle and pedaled here, but you came here this morning to hear the Word of God. And positionally, you're sitting in these chairs and you're set to hear what God can do in your life, but conditionally on the inside, you might still be a mess. You may be sitting in these chairs this morning trying everything that you know how to do to serve God under your own power. And you're trying to do everything that you can, but conditionally you're still struggling with smoking weed. Positionally, I've accepted Christ and I'm coming here and I'm believing the word of God in my life, but conditionally I'm still struggling with alcoholism. Right? See, there's a difference between positional and conditional in our lives. And the difference between positional and conditional is the difference between triumph and victory and maintaining and sustaining triumph and victory in our lives. See, several weeks ago, you may have come up here and, and said, I've been dealing with rejection, Pastor Steve, but I raised my hands and I received victory in that area. I felt that spirit leave me and I was delivered that day However, if you walked out of here and kept saying the same old things you always say and kept listening to the same old people you always listen to and kept turning on the same old radio stations you always listen to and watched the same old TV shows that you've always listened to and didn't get up in the morning and read my Bible just like I've always done and didn't get up and pray like I always say that I want to start doing but I don't, you can end up right back into that area of rejection in your life again without being set free. Hallelujah. And you didn't receive the victory and the triumph in Christ. No. You received the victory and the triumph in Christ, but you under your own power chose to walk away from it after you received it. Now this morning, why am I preaching this? Because some people don't know any better. Some of you know better. Some of you know what to do after you've received deliverance. Some of you know what to do after you've been set free and received healing. And some of you don't have a clue. And it's not a bad thing. It just means maybe you didn't grow up in church. Because for whatever reason, Crystal River Church of God not only attracts people who have been in church for many years of their life, but we also attract people who the first time they ever step through the doors of a church is this church. Why is that? Because we have a pastor that's very real. We have a pastor that stands up here and tells it like it is. We have a pastor that doesn't say, all of you are broken and I am perfect. We have a pastor that stands up here and says, I have faults and I have struggles and I have things that I deal with in life. And then people walking in that hear all of this junk said about Christians go, wow, that's refreshing because he's real. Hallelujah. So verse 15. It says, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved 
and among those who are perishing. We are the fragrance of Christ among those that are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life, and who is sufficient for these things. So it says in this scripture that to the winning side, we're the aroma of life leading to life. But on the losing side, we're the aroma of death leading to life to death. Now the Apostle Paul was a very smart man and he didn't use particular words for no reason. He put the word triumph in there because he was writing to this century Corinthians who were, who were very familiar with Roman rule and knew that when Romans came into a city and conquered it and killed its leaders and killed its king and took over that they would hold what they called a triumphal entry into the city. So they would have a triumphal entry, and in that triumphal entry, it would be led by the general, it would be led by the captains, followed by the the warriors, and then followed by those that they captured in shackles behind them. And then all along the procession, they would be burning incense that would be a sweet, sweet aroma to those who are part of the capture capturing force. To those who are on the winning side, it's a sweet, sweet smell. To those who are captured in chains it's the smell of death that is on the horizon so what in the world does this have to do with us in our life and our own victories and being set free first and foremost you have to think of yourself of more than just a person more than just a body more than just a piece of flesh more than just somebody that man I need to get to the gym more often or I need to eat less chocolate more than just this but you have a spiritual realm around you and in your life and when you are captured by the enemy and you are walking bound up in chains the smell of death reeks around you. But all of a sudden, you have a deliverer that shows up in your life. All of a sudden, the King Jesus steps on the scene and steps into the situation. And he breaks your shackles. He sets you free. And then you're part of a new processional. Your new processional has Jesus Christ at the head of it, marching through the city. And you're part of the of the capturing force at that point. And every demonic stronghold that has come against you is now shackled and weak and powerless against you in the presence of Christ. Hallelujah. So then, in that moment, not only are you part of this processional, but you have a whole host of angels, and you have a whole host of spiritual beings in heaven that are applauding you being set free from your personal situation. You have a whole host, and as as all of heaven applauds for you in that moment that you achieved victory, and all of hell and every demonic force is wincing because they have lost power over you. Amen. Which leads me to the next, the next point. Matthew chapter 12. And you don't have to turn there if you don't want. We'll have it on the screen. When we gain victory in our life over an enemy or over a giant, and we have that triumphal moment, more is required of us to sustain that victory. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus steps on the scene and he, and he speaks and he says this, when an unclean spirit comes out of a man, it passes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. On its arrival, who's the house? You are. It says, I will return to the house I left. And on its arrival... It finds the house vacant, swept clean, and put in order. It's a lot more inviting than it was last time it was there. Swept clean, it's put in order. So then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they go in and dwell there. And the final plight of that man is worse than the first. Now, if an unclean spirit 
comes out of a man, and that's your point of deliverance. That's your point of being set free from whatever spirit that might be, whatever addiction that might be, whatever illness that might be. There's your point that you were set free. You were instantly changed in that instant. What is your responsibility at that point to continue to walk out your healing? I'm glad you asked. We're going to get to that. But before we do, in Matthew chapter 12, there's a couple of applications here that apply. Right, And one of them makes us very uncomfortable in churches. One of us makes us pastors very uncomfortable to talk about. But the first one is demon possession. And you say, okay, well, you just lost me, Steve. (laughs) You just lost me there, man. I'm not sure about all that mess. I'm not sure about that. Listen, demon possession is very real. It was very real in the Bible, and it's very real today. However, there's a caveat. I believe that demon possession is a lot more rare than we think it is. If we see somebody struggling, we immediately think demon possession, when in essence, if you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have received the Holy Spirit, inside of you, you can no longer be possessed by a demon. You can no longer be controlled or accessed from the inside by a demon. A demon can no longer control. So if that's not the case that we're talking about today, what's the second application? The second application is demonization. So what's the difference between demon possession and demonization? Demon possession is on the inside of you, taking control of you because you don't have the Holy Spirit living within you. That's very different than receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit in tongues. That's not what I'm discussing this morning. What I'm talking about is that moment that you accepted Christ into your life, the Holy Spirit stepped into you, and you now have the Holy Spirit living within you. Whether you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit or not, if you've accepted Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. That's what I'm talking about today. And in those situations, demonization happens to many Christians. And you say, man, this is, this is taking a left turn, Pastor Steve. You're going out to left field this morning. Let me, let me explain why I'm at where I'm at. Because I believe that many Christians are demonized. What does demonized mean? It means that your soul is being harassed and tormented by the enemy. Not your spirit. You are not in control. The enemy is not in control of you. Not your spirit. Your spirit man does and always belongs to God. Not your spirit, but your soul. And you say, what in the world then is the difference between my spirit and my soul? Your soul is consistently made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. And if, you, if I said to you that I believe there are many Christians that are demonized in today's society, and then you said, whoa, that's a weird word. I don't quite understand that. Not sure I want to get into that, Pastor Steve. But then if I said to you that there's many Christians who don't have control over their emotions. There's many Christians whose emotions are not in check. There's many Christians who emotionally act out in a way that is not consistent with following Christ. And you would say, yeah, that's true. That's demonization. And you would say that many Christians are struggling in their mind. Many Christians are struggling with dealing with things in their mind, thought processes and thought patterns, and not taking thoughts captive and believing the lies of the enemy and dealing with negativity and dealing with all of these things, rejection. These are demonizations of Christians. So my mind, my will, and my emotions may be demonized, but I'm not demon-possessed. Amen? Is that, is that clear? So, so what three ways cause a Christian to be demonized? Number one, it may be personal trials due to personal decisions that were out of the will of God. You may be going through a trial in your life because you made a decision that you made that was not in the will of God. And that opened you up to demonization of the soul or harassment of the soul. It might be, number two, listening and being being held captive by lies of the enemy. You've sat and counseled with the devil. You've been angry, mad, unforgiving, unyielding, unmoving, and sat in a room and allowed the devil to walk up and lay you down on a couch and sit and counsel you. 
And that is opening you up to demonization of the mind. That is opening you up to believing the lies of the enemy is demonization of the mind. Number three is repeated and consistent sin in an area of your life. It's an area of your life where you may be in here this morning and you say, I am 75% there, man. I've given over 75% of where I'm at to God. I've allowed him access to 75% of my life. But man, I'm just holding on to this 25%. I'm, I'm keeping this back for myself because I'm struggling with giving it up. Because it might be sinful. It might be out of God's will. He might be asking me and requiring more of me than I'm ready to give. Or he might be requiring me to give up a sin which I'm not ready to give up yet because it's still fun to me. (laughs) I can't believe he just said sin is fun. You haven't listened to Pastor Ronnie very long, have you? Sin is fun for a season, but eventually it comes and collects the rent. And when sin comes to collect the rent, it's no longer fun. When you have to pay the price, it's no longer fun. So a consistent and repeated sin in your life will open you up to demonization of the soul. It will open you up. Gaining victory is worthless if we cannot maintain that victory. Gaining victory means nothing if we don't live and sustain that victory in our life. So as I thought about this scripture, I thought about what's a real world situation that I can discuss? What's a real world thing that I can throw out that, that people would understand that Matthew chapter 12, 12 verse where Jesus said that, that, that he returns and finds it swept clean and brings seven even more evil than himself to occupy it because he found it empty right? What's a real world situation? Let's talk about a couple of conflicts that the United States has been in. Is there anybody here that was a Korean War veteran? No. Okay. So nobody here was a Korean War veteran, but let's talk about the Korean War for a second. The Korean War started in June of 1950 as a conflict between South Korea and North Korea. The U.N., alongside the United States, aided South Korea, while China and Russia aided North Korea, and all looked lost for South Korea. South Korea looked like it was done, but after much fighting and much battle and much death, the U.S. forces pushed North Korean troops back, and then a treaty was signed. And then all of a sudden, there was a demilitarized zone which was created in between North Korea and South Korea to serve as a buffer between the evil forces of North Korea and the forces of South Korea. All of a sudden, there was a buffer there in the middle that neither one of them could cross that maintained and held peace. If uh, Before you got saved, if you ever watched the movie A Few Good Men, you may recognize the line, you can't handle the truth. And if you recognize that line, you know that that movie movie was talking about the DMZ zone where our troops would stand stationed with tanks and missiles and sniper rifles and everything they need staring off across that DMZ making sure that the North Korean troops didn't step across. Amen. So this is where we find ourselves in this situation. By the way, if you drive a Kia or a Hyundai today, you can thank a Korean war veteran. Because Kia or Hyundai would not exist if we had not gone in and liberated South Korea and created a democracy where they had an economy and created business and began to ship cars to America for us Americans to buy. It would not exist. Now let's compare that for a minute in that personal situation with Iraq. In 2003, regardless of how we feel about it today, the U.S. invaded Iraq and took out dictator Saddam Hussein. The U.S. maintained a presence in Iraq for a decade, and then public opinion forced President Bush to sign an agreement to complete a troop withdrawal by 2011, and that was completed by President Obama. At the time of our complete troop withdrawal, we left the door open in Iraq in a weakened state to be conquered and all but taken over by ISIS. Have you heard of ISIS? Beheading Christians. Drowning Christians, feeding Christians to wild animals, ISIS. 
So we came in and we aided a country to get rid of a dictator. And then we left that country cleaned up and put in order, but empty of any kind of strong government. And then somebody seven times more evil than the one that was there shows up and takes possession of the, of the country. Now, in Korea, there's a faithfulness and a dedication of 63 years of the U.S. aiding the South Korean people. There's, there's, there's 63 years of the liberating force that came into South Korea and pushed away the North Korean troops, and then they stood guard over that troop. Now, wouldn't it be silly for the South Koreans at any point in time to walk up to the U.S. troops and say, hey, pack it up. Man, y'all, y'all just go home. We don't need you anymore. Hey, you know, we got this. We don't need you anymore. Go ahead and go. That would have been ludicrous for them to do because the U.S. was guarding them against possible reinvasion of somebody who was threatening their livelihood, threatening their life. Now, if you think about that verse for a minute in Matthew 12, how many Christians come into church or come into a prayer meeting or come into a situation and they get delivered, they get set free, they fall out on the ground and God does a work in their spirit and removes the chains and the bondages of the sin and the addictions and the spirits that have attacked them in the past. He removes all of that, and then they get up, and they go, man, I have never felt so good in my life. And they come to church for two and a half weeks, and then they say, I'm all good. I don't need that anymore. Or maybe they got saved, and they got set free, and they got delivered And then for six months, every morning, they got up and they spent time with God because he was their liberating force because he set them free. And every morning for six months, they made time to get out of bed early before they had to leave for work and got on their knees and thanked him for what he had done in their life and entered into relationship with him because he's still protecting them and guarding them from the wiles of the devil. He's still guarding them from the wiles and the tricks and the tactics of the enemy. But then after six months, when things are going good, they say, well, you know, I need more rest. You know, it's a, little, it's a little hard to get up that early in the morning. I need more rest because I need more time to, to energy for work. So I'm not going to do that anymore, God. If South Korea had come to the U.S. and said, thank you. Thank you for liberating us. Thank you for setting us free. Now take a hike. What would have happened to South Korea? So we got to remember that we need to take... We need to take our time each and every day and thank God for what he has delivered us from. And thank God for setting us free and give him his time. Hallelujah. So what does this look like? In order to maintain our victory, we need to know how we got it in the first place. What did you look like when you received victory? Were you worried about your hair? Were you worried about your, your clothes getting wrinkled? Were you worried about, you know, how your makeup looked? Were you worried about any of that stuff in that moment when God set you free and delivered you from those who meant you harm? What did you look like? Number one, here's seven attributes of what it looks like to be set free. Number one, dancing. Man, <laughs> We had a moment of dancing earlier. Dancing. David danced before the ark as it was brought back into the nation of Israel. David stripped down to his underoos and danced in front of the ark as it was being brought into Israel. He was was dancing and worshiping God and so excited. And I don't recommend you strip down in here. I'm just... Do that in your own prayer closet. Do that in your own war room. Amen. But, but David did it in front of the entire, in the entire uh, uh, city. And his wife was embarrassed. And she said, David, put that stuff away. David, cover that up. You look like you. David, you look like an idiot. And David's going, oh, but my king, my king, my king rescued me from where I was. And he's dancing. 
Number two is singing. Every time Israel won a battle, they marched into the city with triumphal singing. And and the crowds sang to worship God and thank God for bringing victory in their lives. How about shouting? Shouting. Sometimes you just need to give a good shout. Sometimes you got to raise your voice so the devil knows that you mean business. You can't always whisper. The enemy sometimes needs to know that you're riled up, that you mean business, and give a shout. Give a shout of praise after marching around Jericho for seven days. The people opened up their mouths, and when they shouted, the walls fell down. When they shouted, the walls fell down. It wasn't just the marching, although the marching was part of the obedience. It wasn't the seven days around the the walls, although that was part of the obedience. But the moment and the thing, the very thing that God used to to crumble the walls was shouting. Sometimes you just have to shout. Persistence in prayer. Daniel persistently prayed for 21 days without seeing an inkling of anything turn around in his life. He sat there and he prayed for 21 days and had not heard a word from God. 21 days. And then all of a sudden, an angel Gabriel burst through and stood before him and said, just so you know, we heard you on the first day. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you may be on day 20 and you've been praying for 20 days for something to turn around in your life. You've been praying for 20 days for something new to take place. You've been praying for 20 days for God to remove a situation out of your life. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning that tomorrow may be day 21 for you where an angel burst through and said not only did God hear you on the first day but God sent a heavenly host of angels to do battle on your behalf and the reason we haven't got to you sooner is because we've been battling the prince of Persia who is a ruler of wickedness that is resting over this entire region and we've been battling him so that we can get to you So before you patty cake and say, God doesn't listen to me. Before you sit there and weep and whine and say, but God didn't do nothing yet. I've been praying for three and a half days. I ain't seen nothing happen yet. How about you open your spiritual eyes? How about you pray, God, show me in the spirit realm what you're doing. Because I don't see it in the physical realm doesn't mean that you're silent. Because I don't see it in the physical realm doesn't mean that you're not working. Lord, show me in the spirit realm what you're accomplishing on my behalf. Because, Lord, I believe that I believe that I believe that as long as I pray, you're going to be faithful to meet my needs. That may not be met the way I want to see them met, but they're going to be met the way God sees fit to meet them. Hallelujah. Persistence in prayer. Number five is obedience. Oh my gosh, we don't like obedience. Gideon didn't like obedience. He sent home thousands of troops being obedient to God. He had 300 troops left. And then God said, no, put your swords up, Gideon. You're not even going to use a sword. You're going to use a water pitcher and a torch. He's like, what are we chasing, Frankenstein? You know, what is this, pitchers and (laughs) torches, you know? What are we doing here? But he was obedient to what God asked him to do. And he marched to the enemy camp where there was thousands encamped below. And with 300 men, he surrounded these thousands of men. And then he was obedient at the moment that God said, break the pitchers and let the light shine. They broke the pitchers and the sound of those pitchers breaking rolled down the hills into the enemy camp. And the enemy thought that they were being taken over by three to 500,000 men. And not only did the sound roll down the mountain and into the enemy camp, but angels Angels went before Gideon and his men and began to cause strife and stir up strife among the enemy. And the enemy killed themselves. Man, how many of you have seen 300 with Sparta? Right? Pretty cool movie. It's a pretty bad movie, actually. It's pretty, yeah, if you, if you don't like blood and guts, you probably don't want to watch that. But at the end of that movie, man, and we idolize these guys. But at the end of that movie, every last one of them was dead. And the enemy was marching through. And yet we have the story of Gideon. Who took 300 men. I guess thousands of enemy. With pitchers. 
and fire and the Lord his God. And God went before him and they didn't have to stick a single sword and the enemy fled, departed. The enemy's plans against him were foiled and all he had to do was be obedient to God. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you have plans against you by the enemy. The enemy has carefully drafted plans to take out your life. And he's trying his best to take you out. I caution you today to be obedient and heed the voice of the Lord so that that doesn't happen in your life. Be obedient. Number six, submission. Anything we hate worse than obedience is the word submission. What do you mean submission? You know, that's a wife's job. <laughs> that's what some guys think, right? Submission's a wife's guy. No, it actually said submit one to another. It's actually a husband's and a wife's job, right? Submission, before we even submit one to another, is to submit to God. In Samson's final moments, Samson caused a lot of harm to the enemy. But Samson was never submitted to God. Samson did his own thing. He chased wild women, wild honey, and locusts. <laughs> Not locusts, wild honey, right? If you know the story. He chased honey. He chased women. He chased folly and gambling and things like this. He was never submitted to God until his final moments of his life. And then after the chickens came home to roost after he paid the rent for all the sin that he had been living. When the, when the landlord showed up and cashed the check for all the sin that he had committed and he had, had his eyes gouged out and lost all his strength and was made and ridiculed by the Philistines. In that moment, he stood in this Colosseum and he finally learned submission to God. And in that moment... He submitted to God. God returned his strength to him, and he took apart the Colosseum and killed more of the enemy that day than any of his, all of his other battles combined up until that day. Submission. In submission to God, there is strength. Number seven, pureness of heart and holiness before the Lord. Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas were preaching the gospel. The rulers didn't like that they were preaching the gospel. They captured them. They ordered them beaten and flogged. They were beaten and whipped, tore to shreds, and then taken to prison and thrown in prison and left there. And then they put them in shackles. Possibly the worst night of their life. You know, I don't, I don't know how many bad nights you've had. But perhaps it was like Paul and Silas where you were laying there and you might not have been bloodied and beaten physically, but maybe you've been bloodied and beaten emotionally. Maybe you've been bloodied and beaten spiritually. Maybe you've been bloodied and beaten in your mind. You're going through torment. You're going through pain. And Paul and Silas are laying on this dirty prison floor, this filthy floor, bleeding and in shackles and chains. Now, most of us in that moment might have been cursing God. Lord, I preach your gospel, and, and now I'm, I'm shackled and chained and beaten and bleeding and laying here on this filthy floor. You know, God, where are you now? But Paul and Silas maintained a pureness of heart and a holiness before God. And even in the midst of their struggles, even in the midst of their pain, began to raise their hands. And Paul would sing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. Laying there bloody and beaten and hurting and in pain. And 
where most of us would give it up and most of us would walk away and they maintain their pureness and their holiness before God and they lifted up their hands and they sang. They sang praises to God. Now there was other people in that room that were bloodied and beaten up. There was other people in that room that were wasting away to nothing that had been shackled and chained and left there. And what did they experience? They saw two people who had been put through what they had been put through. And rather than cursing God and dying, they were praising him. They maintained a pureness and a holiness before God, even in their darkest hour, even in their darkest moment. And what did God do? I believe that as they were sitting there singing with their arms raised, that a heavenly host of angels began to march. And God sent these angels and said, go rescue my boys. Go rescue my boys. And these angels began to march. And they were so big and they were so strong. And there were so many of them that as they marched into this prison, the walls began to shake. And the walls began to shake. And Paul, at first, this is my own commentary, but Paul, at first, maybe, not even, maybe didn't even notice it because he had his hands raised and he was worshiping God. And he may not even have noticed the tremors at first. Maybe Silas noticed them first and saw a cup of water that was shaken and, and shook Paul and said, look at that. What is that? And then pretty soon the walls began to tremble and the walls began to shake and the prison bars began to shake. And then all of a sudden, Paul and Silas were able to stand and the shackles fell off and every cell door in that place was opened because they maintained a pureness and a holiness before God. So how were you rescued? How were you rescued? Maybe you weren't beaten and bloodied in a prison like Paul and Silas, but how were you rescued? Where were you at? Were you giving up on life? Were you contemplating suicide? Were you contemplating drinking again? Were you contemplating that next hit of crack? Were you contemplating selling your body to pay the rent? Were you contemplating leaving your spouse? Were you contemplating walking away from your kids? Were you contemplating all of this stuff happening in your life? And then in just a moment, God stepped in to the situation and said peace be still and the storm around you began to swirl away and the storm around you began to calm and all of a sudden you got your full peace of mind and all of a sudden the joy that was within you began to return and all of a sudden you knew that God had stepped into your situation that God had rescued you see when you begin to lose your victory when you begin to allow that to go away, several things happen before you lose victory. It's not just you wake up one day and, wow, my victory's gone. You know, remember what God did for me several weeks ago in church? It's just gone. See, there's several things that happen to it. First, you, you've lost your joy. You've allowed the enemy to come in and steal your peace and take your joy. And then you've lost your gratefulness. Because you no longer take that 10 to 15 minutes and thank God in the morning for what he did in your life. You no longer put on Christian radio to worship on the way to work. And you start worshiping to the world's music instead and dancing to the beat of the world instead. Because you've lost your gratefulness for what God has done in your life. Maybe you've lost your persistence. So you no longer pray any longer. You've lost your obedience. You no longer listen for God's voice. And then ultimately you've lost your holiness. And you no longer follow God's rules or God's word. And you began to do your own thing. See, these are several characteristics that happen long before you lose your victory. If you start fixing it on the first characteristic, then you'll never get to the point to where you've lost your victory. When your joy disappears and you fix it, then you'll never get to the point to where the enemy can steal your victory. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. I'm going to read for you. You don't have to turn there because we're, we're low on time. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. 
And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately... Say immediately. Immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up stood and walked and entered the temple with them. Walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had just happened to him. Here's the next verse. Verse 11. It says, Now as the lame man who was healed, held. Look at your neighbor and say, held. As a lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which was called Solomon's, greatly amazed. Have you held on to the one who brought you victory? This lame man knew where his victory came from. He had been begging for years since he was a child at that gate. And for years, he still couldn't walk. And for years, people walked by him into the temple prepared to worship. And for years, some people may have dropped a penny in his hand, and some people may have walked on by. For years, this man was left alone in this situation. For years, nobody was there to help him. For years, he had not received his healing. And then all of a sudden, two men doing the work of Jesus Christ, walk by and rather than dropping a penny in his hand they pray a prayer of healing over him they help him up and he receives his healing that day the next part of that scripture is is awesome because it says he followed them into the temple for years he laid at the gate of the temple and could not go into the temple to worship for years he wasn't healed but the moment he got his healing he knew where his healing came from the moment he received his healing he got up and he held on to Peter and John. He said, where are you going? Because I'm going with you. Oh, you guys going to churches for some chicken? I'm going with you. Oh, you guys going to Taco Bell? You making a run for the border? I'm going too, man. I love tacos. Wherever Peter and John were going, he was going with them. Oh, you're going into the temple to listen to the preaching? Man, that's where I'm going. I'm going to the temple to listen to the preaching. Oh, you're going to raise your hands and worship? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise my hands and worship. Where are you guys going? And I can imagine, it says he held on to Peter. Peter and John. I can imagine Peter and John standing there, possibly teaching in the temple courtyards, and this man laying at their feet, latched on to their legs, because he doesn't want to let go of where he got his victory. Hallelujah. How many of us this morning can say the same? That we haven't let go of where we received our victory. Come help me close. Here's your four D's of maintaining victory, dedication. Philippians 1.21 says, For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It means no matter what I do, I'm going to follow Christ. Number two is diligence. Proverbs 22.29 says, Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. The diligent are not moved by the weather. The diligent are not moved by a family member's lack of serving God. The diligent are not even moved by a troubled marriage. The diligent are not moved by desires of the flesh. But the diligent continue to do what they know to be right. Number three is development. You have to continue to develop in who you are in Christ. God, Jesus said... Go into all the world and make disciples. Disciples. Develop. You have to to grow. You can't stay 
where God first found you. You can't stay there. You have to continue to grow. And number four is discipline. Hebrews 12, 11 says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> For the moment, all discipline seems painful. It seems painful to, to, to not watch rated R movies. You know, I made a decision years ago that I was not going to watch any more rated R movies because I didn't like what it was doing to my spirit. And sometimes that's painful because sometimes there's some rated R movies I really want to see. But I don't because I have discipline in that area of my life. Proverbs 12.1 says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. I think Pastor Ronnie wrote this one. It says, but he who hates reproof is stupid. But this is the truth. And if you got nothing else out of this message today, get this. And if you're taking notes, write this down. An undisciplined life is vulnerable to demonic attacks. An undisciplined life is vulnerable to demonic attack. If you don't want demonic attack in your life, get some discipline in your life what you watch what you listen to when you get up how time you spend with God time you spend in the word get some discipline in your life to maintain that DMZ between your victorious force and the enemy because the moment you start letting discipline fly out the window that DMZ gets smaller and smaller and smaller until the enemy is knocking on your front door amen stand with me today What's my last slide, Mike? How do you sustain your victory? You stay in relationship with your liberating force. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you're in this place today and you've never made a decision for Jesus Christ, you've never made a decision to give your life and turn your life over to Him, if you're in this place today and you would like to do that right now, I'm not going to embarrass you. It's easy to do but it requires something of you afterwards. It's easy as A, B, C, A, that you acknowledge your need for a Savior, B, you believe He died on a Christ for you, cross for you, and C, that you confess it out of your mouth. If there's anybody in this place right now that would like to receive Christ as their Savior, I'm just going to ask you to lift a hand. You can put it right back down. But if that's you in this place and you need a liberator in your life, just lift a hand and put it right back down. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Okay. We're going to pray with those that lifted their hands to receive Christ. And then we're going to open up the, the altars. And if anybody needs prayer for anything, I'm going to go ahead and ask the Spirit Life team to go ahead and come down here and get ready. Just repeat after me. Father, I need you. I need to be liberated. I need to be set free. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Thank you for what you did on the cross. I receive you as my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Give a hand clap of praise for those two that gave their hearts to Christ. I'm going to pray a prayer of dismissal, but the altar is open. So if you need prayer for anything, maybe what we've preached about today, what we've talked about, if you need prayer for anything other than that, come on down and, and get prayer. We don't ever want to keep you from the opportunity to receive at the altar. But I'm going to pray a prayer of dismissal, and then you're dismissed. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to be in your house today. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit that has hovered over this place all morning. Thank you, Lord, for doing a work in everybody here. Thank you, Father, for going before us as we apply these principles to our life. Lord, give us the strength. Help us to be obedient to you. Help us to have faith and, and, and knowledge in you, Father. Help us to grow and be discipled and help us to submit to you on a regular basis. And Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.
Hey.